going to allow him to tell his story. In 2000. In 2009, uh, the Sun newspaper had a big uh, banner at the Labour Party conference saying, don't you know there's a bloody war on? Uh, where are they now? I mean, we've got with their three major conferences, and Plaid Cymru passed a, uh, a resolution uh, calling for the troops to be brought home, but all the major conferences the war doesn't exist. There was one word uh, today which Afghanistan was mentioned, but mentioned only in relation to a tribute to young people in the service they were doing. But uh, as an issue, uh, it, it doesn't uh, exist. We went to Iraq in pursuit of non-existent <coughs> weapons of mass destruction. 179 British soldiers died. Uh, today I was at the conference sitting next to Frank Judd, who was a minister in Harold Wilson's uh, cabinet. Harold Wilson didn't feel he had to join in the, the war then in Vietnam, and none, no British soldiers died. And the reason that we went uh, to that war is because the, uh, there were 50 Labour MPs who were doubtful about the war and expressed their uh, doubts, who were bribed, uh, bullied, bamboozled into abstaining or voting for the war, and 139 of us voted against. If those 50 had been allowed to vote the way their consciences told them, we wouldn't have joined that uh, war, and 179 British lives would have been saved. We stayed in Helmand province uh, in order to protect Britain from a non-existent <laughs> Taliban terrorist threat uh, to this country. We are now hearing the war drums beating, uh, urging us to go to war in order to protect us from non-existent Iranian long-range missiles carrying non-existent Iranian nuclear bombs. It's an extraordinary situation. In January of this year, a young soldier from Pembrokeshire who'd gone through um, extraordinary, dreadful experiences. He'd been shot <laughs> twice. Uh, and still escaped, flesh wounds there. He was involved in two other incidents uh, which involved bombs. But the torment that he had when he came home uh, from Afghanistan was that his best friend, who had limbs were away, he died in his arms. He was holding him and he saw the, the life drain out of his eyes. And this is the torment that he had and he took his life in January this year. He's not counted among the 433 dead. After the Falklands War and the Vietnam War, more soldiers took their lives after the, after the war than died in combat. 433 British lives, an uncounted number of Afghan lives, 2,000 plus Americans there. There are also 10,000 soldiers who returned broken in body and mind. The new minister, Justine Greening, uh, told me I was being pessimistic when well, I suggested this on the, the Thursday we finished. Because didn't I realize, yes, there were bad things happened. Didn't I realize there was something like five Paralympic medals as a result of the war. <laughs> and so you, you, mustn't be, you mustn't think of war as killing these people. You just think of it as a chance for getting a Paralympic medal. You know, if you're lucky enough to have your limbs blown off. I mean, it does seem an extraordinary uh, position to be in. But on the Thursday of last week, on the Monday and the Tuesday, ministers said, and these are people who are sober, intelligent ministers, <coughs> repeated the great lie that we're in Afghanistan in order to stop terrorist acts on our streets. And I, I said when David Milliman is the uh, foreign secretary, have you ever asked the Taliban why they're killing us? And he said no, and I went through it and said, now what do you think they'd say? Would they say, we're going to kill all your soldiers, so when we kill them all, we're coming over to Manchester and to Newport, we're going to blow, blow you all up. Would they say that? No, they would say that. What they're going to say is we're killing you because you are a foreign force, you are the Ferengi, and it's our sacred duty uh, to kill those who occupy our land uh, using force, using weapons. In the same way as our fathers did, and our great-grandfathers did, that's what 
our task is. That's why uh, they tell you, and it's fairly easy, it's not a great leap of intelligence to realize how we stop that happening. And we stop that happening by coming out. Now, the Canadians two years ago decided <coughs> to leave. Uh, so did the, the Dutch, and their troops are, are, are safely home. The French are coming out earlier than planned, and so are the New Zealanders. But there was a, there was a lot of moment uh, in uh, Parliament when I, I pointed out that the <coughs> only reason uh, why our troops are still there is to act as human shields for ministers' reputations. They're there to ensure that the end of the war can be spun as a victory for politicians. Siegfried Sassoon did a declaration against war in 1917, saying this war is being prolonged by those that have the power to stop it. Front bench, they're, they're the people who are prolonging the war. And the, I also said that the, they don't have, they're not under the uh, obligation, as we seem to be, to stay there, not when it's sensible to come out, when it's our own national decision, but in order to go along with the timetable of the Americans. Uh, we are told that we have to have an independent nuclear weapon because we are independent of the rest of the world. It costs us a fortune, it's meaningless, never use it, of course, but we have to have it because we're independent. I was at a, a fringe meeting yesterday and I asked uh, the great uh, Alistair Campbell, who um, it was quite an interesting point. I mean, um, in, in the, it, they also questions at the end of this, and I, I popped up and the, the chairman said, the gentleman down there, and Alistair Campbell said, that's our gentleman. He said, that's Paul Flynn. <laughs> uh, and the question was this, you know, when we were talking about, uh, you know, the way that the, the Labour Party made its policy in, in past years, when did we change from a party that at the core of our beliefs was, was the battle for peace, was the, was, was the struggle for, for, uh, for internationalism? When did we change to, to adopt the doctrine of the Tory party which is, hey, you know, preaches it, not the, uh, which is wider still and wider, saying that we must punch above our weight. You know, why? Why should we punch above our weight? Punching above our weight always means that we die beyond our responsibilities, as we're doing now in Afghanistan. It makes no sense uh, to continue to be there. The outlook is bleak. In 2006, there was a debate uh, when John Reid announced that we were going into Helmand province, we were going in there with soft hats to do a bit of reconstruction, and uh, his hope was that another shot uh, would be fired. Uh, I, I made a speech at that time uh, saying that this was like the charge of the Light Brigade. Blair to the left of them, Bush to the right of them, hollered and thundered. There's not a reason why, there's what to do and die. Into the valley of the shadow of death, into the mouth of the helm and drove the 5,000. Never in my wildest dreams did I think we'd go from two soldiers who died in combat in 2006, we've been there five years, two combat deaths to 433 we have now. And it's not the charge of the Light Brigade, it's the charge of the Light Brigade multiplied by three, at least three times as many died in this hopeless, futile attempt to take a country from a culture that's firmly rooted in the 13th century and try to turn them into a Scandinavian democracy. We went in there, there was a civil war between the North and the South, the Pashtun army that doesn't speak, uh, and, uh, and the Uzbeks from the North who don't speak the same languages, and almost certainly they'll go back to their, their <coughs> tribal loyalties. And the fragile advances we made in women's rights and education, there are some, uh, sadly are, are collapsing now, and we're retreating uh, from the, the, what, what's happened in Helm and the, the progress made there. If we look at all the other factors, Tony uh, Blair came to the Husqvarna and said, we must go into Afghanistan. It's, uh, it's a, a, another duty that we must have because you should realize that 90% of the heroin in Britain is grown in Afghanistan. After 10 years, 90% of the heroin in Britain is grown in Afghanistan. There is a difference. Now there's much more of it, and it's cheaper. <laughs> corruption, the corruption is far worse because we've fed it, poured in 20 billion pounds of our taxpayers' money, the great bulk of which has been run by a banking system that existed uh, to pass money on to the leaders of the country 
in order to tart up their boat holes in Dubai. Uh, so there was a, no progress on, on any of those fronts. And we got hold of Karzai, uh, no particular merit, except that he could speak English and was involved with the West, and put him in as our puppet leader. And why does anyone believe that when we get out, instead of the, the green on blue death now, that Afghans will go to war, that they'll slaughter their brother and sister Afghans to serve an election ringing corrupt leader who, who's a foreign puppet, or to serve the interest of the West. And they will not do that. So uh, what happened in the House of Commons, I'll, I'll finish this point, otherwise I'd like to talk for the rest of the evening. What, what happened on the, the last Tuesday, which uh, of Parliament, is I, I, I made these points and said that we were in a position very much like the end of the First World War, when politicians lied and soldiers died. And those on the front bench were again the ministerial donkeys who were leading our brave soldier lions. Uh, just about in order in the conduct of the House. The Speaker then gave me a real dilemma, because <coughs> he said to me, are you saying that ministers lied? Uh, and yep. I'm trapped. I mean, there's no way I'm saying that ministers did not lie. Of course they've lied. They've been lying, you know, since uh, 2001. The whole, the whole yeah. justification of the war is a giant lie. Yeah. But having said that, I'm now relieved of my parliamentary duties, and which I'll take up on October the 23rd. But having been thrown out of the House means that there was some attention given uh, on the national news. There was some way of getting that case across. And we know that 80% of the public are with us now. But we, we have the second party conference we've had, no mention of Afghanistan in, in any of the main debates at all. You know, it, it's a dead subject. It doesn't exist. It's not happening. It's an illusion. Forget about it. And to the politicians have spun the ending that they wish, which will show them as heroes. Uh, in that time, Jeremy and uh, we, we, we went so long to, uh, to 10 Downing Street with a, a petition. And uh, I think it was in March, calling for the truce we want. Since then, 25 <coughs> soldiers have died, British soldiers have died. If we carry on till 2014, 100 more will die. And they're dying to act as human shields for politicians. They're dying, not sadly for a noble cause, which must be a bitter pill for their loved ones to accept one day, but they're going to have to accept it tragically, that there isn't a, a sacrifice in this war uh, that was worth dying for. And I'm saying that knowing, as, as a son of a soldier, who believes that the valor, the professions of a soldier is as great as any that's taken place in all our military history. No criticism of them whatsoever or of their intentions. But this war is a war that history will judge uh, to be an unjust war. Our involvement in it is because of the pride and vanity of politicians. Um, and that's a dreadful thing uh, to say. But we've had these two wars and we must certainly learn the lesson to bring the soldiers home as quickly as possible and ensure that we don't stumble into a further war in Iran. Thank you, comrades. <laughs>